The first we ever heard of the Boonox's return was the Boonox video game. I distinctly remember I found out through the Boonox music uploading about it. It wasn't loud, not many people were talking about it. I mean, I mean they, they made a Facebook post, so uh, not really a surprise. But the designs did look cool. The conversation surrounding the prospect of the Boonox and the characters within a video game is something that I've actually heard quite a bit before. It also felt like a progressive way of moving the series into a different medium. The Boonox has always innovated itself by modernizing concepts and ideas for a new generation, but a mobile game. This was admittedly a disappointing element to see. I'm not one of those people clamoring for the Boonox to create an open world GTA 5 adventure. To me, it's really clear that this is an indie game with a smaller budget, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm completely fine with that. But given the scale of the franchise and how, well, how predatory mobile games can often be, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little mixed on the idea. Original mobile titles are designed to be simple and use cosmetics and gambling mechanics to exploit their audiences for real life money. It's not hard to imagine why people aren't crazy about the idea. This isn't to knock the idea of a Boonox video game entirely. And I think given the right framework, it could be something quite special. Come on! Yeah, yeah! For the most part, titles that feel higher in scale aren't original titles designed for mobile. They're ports of existing games made for accessibility, but it's rarely the platform that they're designed for. I'm going to be keeping in mind the parameters and scale for this title. Everything I'm communicating is possible to be ported to mobile, but I'd also be lying if I said I wasn't also considering the prospect of a Steam release. For stars, let's take a look at some of the Boonox's influences. Capcom. But it's historically had a strong influence on the Boonox's designs, and it's really clear to see the influence on the video game. Rival Schools and Mega Man Battle Network come to mind. These are retro games which seemingly be, be, seem to be influencing the UI design a lot too, to be blunt. So this title seems to be harkening back to consoles like the Dreamcast and the Game Boy Advance. In fact, there's some really direct parallels you can make from the design shown off and, well, with the games I'm talking about. I've played Rival Schools, and while it's a fun game, I don't think the Boonox should be shooting for a 3D title. That's not to say that they can't integrate 3D models within one, but more that I think the application should be seamless, like small background elements. I think it's clear that this game is going to be doing something along the lines with pixel art. This is where I think Mega Man Battle Network is probably a better game to draw influence from. Not only is it on the GBA, but it actually has a world for you to explore in and a simple battle system that, you know, incentivizes you to keep leveling up and playing. I've gone on record asking my audience several times what they'd want from a Boonox video game, and consistently the prospect of an RPG or a beat em up is brought up. I actually think this is a good idea because one, well, <laughs> Well, South Park did it, but also because it allows for a heavy emphasis on story as well as gameplay. Beam ups aren't exactly known for their intricate storytelling, but it isn't impossible. River City Girls does this really cool thing where the cutscenes are told through manga panels. I mean, they already did some comics back in 2019, so I, I don't, I don't really think it'd be impossible. What if we have a hoe for a grandma and she comes to school on career day? Oh, what if they have kids? We have a brother or sister that's half hoe. Riley, shut your dumb ass up. The big thing for me is that whatever narrative is going on doesn't distract heavily from the gameplay. In crossing into a different medium, the Boonox has to accommodate that medium. The comic had to look good, the show had to be funny, and by extension, the game has to be a good game. Like that's the priority. But thankfully, there are ways to blur the lines between narrative and gameplay. Something I quite like about Battle Network is that it lets you explore the world. This is something that I actually quite liked about the Simpsons games when I was young. I remember playing Simpsons Hit and Run and one of my favourite things to do in that game was like it it felt like you understood the world like i know where flanders lives i know where the power plant is relative to the simpson home all of this stuff goes a long way in telling the immersion of the world to the player and bound neck what does this with well <laughs> with, with pixels there's quite a few titles like this actually sonic battle has a 3d bow arena using sprites and it's you know it's once again a gba game a lot of people assume that giving a game a pixelated style inherently limits it, when in actuality, it can actually add a really distinct style and otherwise, you know, <laughs> an otherwise lifeless game. I mean, again, a lot of indie titles do this. There's a lot of locations in the Boonox that we have no idea, <laughs> we don't have any idea where they're even located. Where does the Dubois family live? Where's Ruckus' shack? Where's the cinema? Where's Betty Von Housen? Where's that fat mansion with slick back? We don't, we don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> Sell the world to the player, make us care about it. There's an interview with Aaron where he explains why Huey and Riley don't have parents from a writing standpoint, and I, I think it's really interesting. Why don't you have the two boys being brought up by their grandfather? Uh, the boys are brought up by their grandfather because I felt if they were brought up by their parents, the parents would be a little too hands-on. 
uh, and having, you know, the grandfather whose attitude is, you know, well, now that I've gotten you into a nice neighborhood, I basically, you know, you have nothing to worry about and I can just watch television all day. It uh, it was meant to, to, to sort of allow the boys to sort of have to, uh, you know, encounter the neighborhood on their own uh, with with not as much sort of parental supervision uh, or, 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 uh, or oversight than, than they would have if their parents were actually there. Like, okay, for example, you could have a set piece be Jasmine's lemonade stand. You can interact with it and purchase items from the shop. The more you interact with her, the higher your friendship gauge grows and you get discounts and deals. I can't think of many ways that Jasmine would fit in such a violent game, so I think relegating her to a shop peeper role is it's, it's fine. I've seen games do it before. She can't even be like Cream because she doesn't have a chow. Blowing the lines between gameplay and world building is a key part of strong game design. The ability to immerse players with gameplay that incentivizes replay value or supplements like character interactions on world building really does go a long way. I've brought the idea of having a friendship gauge, and while this isn't the time to talk about a dating sim, <laughs> I hope not. Oh, but <laughs> I think the experience of leveling up is an underrated element of game design. It's one of the first quintessential thrills of any video game. Like, I'm supposed to put this game down like an hour ago, but, you know, one more level and my Pokemon evolves or learns a new move. Sonic Battle has a grinding system where the more you fight, the more experience and moves you can unlock and customize with your character. Even River City Girls, the beat em up, has a shop where you can buy more moves and items and, you know, etc. And on top of leveling up, you're awarded money which you can spend on more moves. This is game design that incentivizes you to keep on playing, because you can visually see the improvements being made within the gameplay. Naturally, don't arbitrarily limit what the players can do to the point where it feels unplayable, but use it as a means to encourage players to immerse themselves in the world, both in gameplay and narrative. Okay, dating sim, let's talk about it. <laughs> the problem, okay. The problem with dating sims in video games is that they're supposed to be about learning more about the characters around you in a way that doesn't overtly distract from the pacing of the main narrative. An example of a game that does this relatively well is Persona. The problem is it just ends up being a romance simulator half the time. You listen to a girl's problems twice and, and then you're fucking. <laughs> then you fuck. That's it. That's literally half dating sims, half all these mechanics in these games. We don't want that. I'm not interested in seeing Grandad cut Tom Dubois. Instead, well, use it to flesh out the characters. Gangster Lissus is in two episodes and he's a fan favourite. Cindy is in free and speaks rarely, and for some reason she's a fan favorite. Ming got one, count them, one, one episode, and people love her. People like these characters, and exploring their various relationships with each other in an optional side quest, you know, it would, it would be cool. Similar to Persona, the incentive for this could be more unlockables, like new moves, new items, team attacks, etc, etc. And I'm like, you know, for the people that say, oh, that, that wouldn't be funny, like, it's boondocks, make it funny. <laughs> Would you, I don't know what to tell you. Make it funny. It's not hard. You throw Home Alone is just an episode about Huey and Riley being home alone. And it's one of the best episodes of the show. It's not hard. Have faith in the you know, have faith in the source of the characters. I don't know what to tell you. Team attacks are a big part of games with multiple playable characters. Partner dynamics, ultimate moves, whatever you want to call it. I think that'd be pretty cool too. The World Ends With You, once again, does this thing where it pushes you to unlock these abilities by progressing through the story, or spending money on abilities in the shop. I don't even think having visual novel-esque sections would be that alien from the boondocks. There's several moments in the show where characters just dump their backstory on the Freeman trio, and well, I mean this happens all the time in those sorts of games, <laughs> so it kinda fits. Going back to the world building point, you could even take some cues from Yakuza, not, not visually cause, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean like how both main characters in the game run a business. You could have Grandad run a business similar to the Itis. This could be another means of gaining money to spend on unlockable moves and items, without reducing it all to grinding on enemies. It's also an interesting way of engaging with the world around you, as people from various financial backgrounds would come in and, you know, talk about Woodcrest. Perhaps depending on how you choose to run the business, you can see the impact on the community of Woodcrest. You can gentrify it, run it down, bring it back, make it black, like immerse people with the game design. And honestly, that's all I really have to say on it. Some presentation cues from modern beat em ups, a retro inspired overworld, a battle system that takes advantage of each respective character's traits. Like, it's not. I don't think it's that hard. Huey's a martial artist that uses a series of weapons. Riley's a long range fighter sniping people down. Grandad's a grapple fighter. He uses his whip to lock people in. I'm thinking like Floyd from Streets of Rage 4. Jasmine could low key be a white mage. Like, I think a healing role for her could be really cool. Tom could be a tank. I mean, he already has the shield, so he can be focused on defensive play. 
he, he's a meat shield. <laughs> and building movesets, whether it's a beam up, RPG, or traditional fire, or whatever, I don't think it should be too difficult given the wide range of skills the characters have showcased throughout the show. That's all I've got though. Regardless of what form the Boondocks game tries to take, I think, I think a lot of this stuff is doable. We've seen it be done before. The ideas I'm presenting, at least to me, they aren't, they aren't that, that, they aren't that ambitious. All of this and more has been accomplished on limited hardware like the GBA. I guess I'm just mildly concerned about the idea of this being a mobile title. Yes, Pokemon Go was successful. Yes, everybody has a phone. But mobile game development rarely invites innovation or intricate level design. It invites microtransactions and you know this isn't even me dissing mobile games either and i get why they would choose to do this you know whether that's what's planned or not mobile games are ridiculously profitable they rack up millions millions literally millions in microtransactions but but in order to do that the games inherently have to be designed as really simple and i'm not really interested in you know the endless runner game where i gotta pay two pound 99 just to keep playing as riley <laughs> If this video does anything, I hope it opens people up to the ideas of what a Boondocks video game could look like. How it could integrate game design into its world building and character interactions. I don't think this is what we're getting, but it's a nice thing to think about.